In 1970, the World Health Organization endorsed the importance of eye care in the overall fight to improving economic standards and education around the world. Improved vision leads to increased income levels, better food supply, and opportunities for higher education, clean water, housing, better sanitation, and greater access to quality health services. In the 10 years we have existed, we've completed eye projects around the globe, and we've provided restored vision to over 30,000 underprivileged men, women, and children. We estimate that in the 10 years, about a quarter and a million eyeglasses have gone through this building. I'm an optician by trade, and that's how I make my living. It provides me with a lovely family, a great home. Um, all my needs are met. And I figure by giving it back a couple hours a week is a small payment indeed for what I've been blessed with. We usually get our glasses through the Lions Club. They're brought in in boxes and then we process them by uh, sorting. Now we sort them into different categories, the single vision, bifocals, sunglasses, and then we neutralize the glasses. And then we label them and package them according to male, female, the children, and uh, whether they're plus or minus. We, we do have some uh, fun. We do tease each other and have to, a lot of camaraderie. We often get a lot of volunteers like boys clubs, girl guides. So we always have lots of people, new people every week that we're training. When we're in the field, generally it's a different group. Um, a team is assembled, say, a year before, not even quite, and they may meet for the first time at the airport. They have to get into a really uh, well-organized, well-run unit as quickly as they can humanly possibly do it. first arrived here in Icho Khan, there was a nice welcoming committee there. There were probably oh, 25 people or so that gave us a nice big cheer when we got off the bus. They've been very welcoming. Sisters of Mercy are an order of nuns out of um, Newfoundland. They're incredible. They work very hard. They're um, incredibly nice. They're funny. They're real people. They know who needs the help we can get, and that's what it's all about. Having a host like this group of nuns here in Ichikan and Kalamaka that can get the poor to us so that we can provide them with the service. Start people here in the or two. That door, we'll have a table here, and that's where we'll do case histories, get their names, that sort of thing, get signed in. We'll walk over here, down to the end of the hallway, and we'll do visual acuities up against the wall. So this is the auto room. Nice and dark. Little bit higher. Dark. One optometry examiner here. This is the dispensary where they're going to collect the glasses. Now you are in the town of Ichokan, which is the seat of the parish. It's a city, very, very ancient from the time of the colonies. The majority of the population here are peasants, and they are out in the in the fields. And conditions are hard. This year we're going through terrible drought and all the corn crop is lost completely. So my village was the first village to come to receive these glasses and the eye surgeries. So there are people coming for about a month every Sunday and announcing in the local village church that they were going to have this glasses program. Basically what happened is everyone got together in the plaza and there's not really transport so we waited and we all loaded into a cattle truck and we got here and walked them through the process. Well I just discovered that this lady here has an um, interesting uh, situation with her right eye. Uh, if she covers her left eye, 
y apunte a los de bebé, qué parte ve, qué parte ve. She's only, she's pointing out that she can only see from my shoulders down. No ve mi cabeza. She cannot see my head. Especially in the case of the Down syndrome children, they've always been uh, very nearsighted. So we are delighted and the children are also very excited that finally their eyes can be tested, measured and they can get help. They can get glasses in order to see better. Still darling, it seems like he has since it's been clear. Once you put the glasses on her, you can tell she's kind of looking through them. Once you fought having the glasses put on her face, and as soon as they're on, look at her looking around now. That young child, his whole family was wiped out by the shining pack, and he was found in a pile of dead people. I suppose the mother had him. He was a year old. Kids in the orphanage. They need a lot of love because usually they don't have parents, they don't have relatives. Yeah, so they're really thankful for all what they can get out of you. You can just play with them or talk to them and they will be fine with it. It's not a perfect fit, but we can't get her to keep them on. <laughs> gets quite routine at home and um, I think if you give something to people you always get a lot more back and we really do get a lot back when we go on these trips. Well, the first day is always the worst day. We don't do that many cases, we start late but I think things are going to go well. This machine only stays on for about five minutes. Nothing seems to be going our way on the first day. I think in the more remote areas where people don't have the money, a lot of times if the grandparents have gotten to the stage that they, they can't work in the fields or separate the grains and things like that, um, the parents and the kids don't have the time to spend with them because they're out working themselves and uh, so they become shut-ins. If they can get you know, one eye to see better again, it, it can make a whole world of difference to not only to them but their families. But suddenly they can be helping out and the families looking after the children so the parents can work. This patient doesn't see and can't hear anything, so we're not able to s say much to him. Cataracts are kind of a universal problem. They're particularly common in the sun belt and in the altitude. People are just more exposed to the ultraviolet as well, so that you're, you're going to see fairly advanced cataracts here. She had a cataract operation last week in Cajamarca. It's quite exciting when you take the covers off and someone that had only light perception vision and hadn't seen their kids for a while. Just the joy in the face is amazing to see. Justino Armas Sanchez is a cobbler here in town. So his living depends on his ability to see it near and work on the shoes. And we're giving a plus three and a quarter prescription. He's never had glasses before. Cuatro, dos, tres. It's hard for anyone to conceptualize until you have a, a loss of vision how, how much that impacts your life. The, the cobbler is so grateful to just be able to see, to work on resoling people's shoes, that he was ecstatic to have a pair of glasses and without them he would lose his trade. Um, at a certain point the quality of his work would drop so much that people would patronize another cobbler. So for him uh, the impact is enormous. The whole world opens up to them again. Uh, my most memorable case so far would, would have to be Nielsen, the little 12-year-old uh, boy. And he came in and immediately you knew that something wasn't right. His shoulders were all hunched over. When he sat down, he, he just sort of curled into himself and you could tell his, his self-esteem was terrible. Uh, it turns out that he was very myopic. He was minus 17. 
in, in each eye, which is very, very high, meaning that anything beyond pretty much the end of his nose was really, really blurry for him. Whether we have anything for Nielsen is the next question. I put some glasses on him. He kind of raised his head a little bit and had a look around, and uh, he started to cry. Like, he just started to tear up a little bit. You could just see him opening up. I mean, he is from Ichokan. He's not one from one of the surrounding villages. And yet the sisters had never seen him before. They didn't know who he was. It gives you an idea of how, how insular his, his life has been uh, because of his vision. He's 12 years old, but he hasn't gone to school yet. He didn't go to school before because he couldn't see. He wants to go to school now. Yeah. 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 You should feel special. Let's ask him, are you excited? Because I have my phrase book here, okay? So it's gonna be under making friends, okay? Look at this. We got it from Arturo. Thank you for me, amigo Trevor. Mission accomplished. We talked 3,700 people or more probably over the last few weeks. It's been a humbling and uplifting experience. Our, uh, new slogan became Mas Grande es Mas Bonito. <laughs> Just trying to make them think that, well, if the gringo wears them, it must be okay. It was very successful and uh, hopefully we did some good. A huge, huge thanks has to go to the sisters. This is the smoothest project I've ever been on and it is because of the work that they've done. Thank you for making our stay uh, very enjoyable. Woo! Woo! You have uh, met some of the simplest people in our area. Never seen a doctor and never would have had an opportunity to get their eyes tested. To have glasses here is a luxury. So we really, really thank you. The comments of the people more than anything is how kind you have been. You bless you. In 1970, the World Health Organization endorsed the importance of eye care in the overall fight to improving economic standards and education around the world. Improved vision leads to increased income levels, better food supply, and opportunities for higher education, clean water, housing, better sanitation, and greater access to quality health services. In the 10 years we have existed, we've completed eye projects around the globe and we've provided restored vision to over 30,000 underprivileged men, women and children. We estimate that in the 10 years, about a quarter and a million eyeglasses have gone through this building. I'm an optician by trade and that's how I make my living. It provides me with a lovely family, a great home, um, all my needs are met. And I figure by giving it back a couple hours a week is a small payment indeed for what I've been blessed with. We usually get our glasses through the Lions Club. They're brought in in boxes and then we process them by uh, sorting. Now we sort them into different categories with single vision, bifocals, sunglasses, and then we neutralize the glasses. And then we label them and package them according to male, female, the children, and uh, whether they're plus or minus. 
Yeah. We, we do have some uh, fun. We do tease each other and have a lot of camaraderie. We often get a lot of volunteers, like boys clubs, girl guides. So we always have lots of people, new people every week that we're training. When we're in the field, generally it's a different group. Um, a team is assembled, say, a year before, or not even quite, and they may meet for the first time at the airport. They have to get into a really uh, well-organized, well-run unit as quickly as they can humanly possibly do it. It's nice to see them in the airport in the beginning when you were just like friendly and, and just jovial as regular people are. And then obviously we grow together as not just a team but a family. <laughs> Customs can either be very quick or it can be a two to five hour process. Sometimes they're interested in just hassling us for special reasons. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, they would like us to count every, uh, you know, uh, pair of glasses that we brought here today. And how many do you have, sir? Uh, we have approximately 10,000. When we first arrived here in Ichokan, there was a nice welcoming committee there. There were probably oh, 25 people or so that gave us a nice big cheer when we got off the bus. They've been very welcoming. Sisters of Mercy are an order of nuns out of um, Newfoundland. They're incredible. They work very hard. They're um, incredibly nice. They're funny. They're real people. They know who needs the help we can give, and that's what it's all about. Having a host like this group of nuns here in Ichikan and Kalamaka that can get the poor to us so that we can provide them with a service. Start people here. We'll enter through that door. We'll have a table here, and that's where we do case histories, get their names, that sort of thing. We'll walk over here, down to the end of the hallway, and we'll do visual acuities up against the wall. So this is the auto refractor room. Nice and dark. Little bit higher. One optometry examiner in here. This is the dispensary where they're going to collect the glasses. Now you are in the town of Ichokan, which is the seat of the parish. It's a city, very, very ancient from the time of the colonies. The majority of the population here are peasants, and they are out in the in the fields. And conditions are hard. This year we're going through terrible drought and all the corn crop is lost completely. So my village was the first village to come to receive these glasses and the eye surgeries. So there are people coming for about a month every Sunday and announcing in the local village church that they were going to have this glasses program. Basically what happened is everyone got together in the plaza and there's not really transport so we waited and we all loaded into a cattle truck and we got here and walked them through the process. Well I just discovered that this lady here has an um, interesting uh, situation with her right eye. Uh, if she covers her left eye, she's, only, she's pointing out that she can only see from my shoulders down. No baby cabeza. She cannot see my head. Uh, Espanol? Yeah. Professor Espanol? Mm -hmm. Not knowing how to speak Spanish. I guess that, I mean, for sure is the biggest challenge ever. I mean, very sad that every time they go, no hablo Espanol, right? Like, I, I wish I could speak more to them. A lot of the people who we're dealing with are illiterate or um, of limited education. A lot of the concepts that we're trying to describe in glasses and uh, the uses for glasses are very difficult to explain and we're highly reliant on translators. The day, you know, can be long. We're seeing hundreds of people. It's really, really busy, so you gotta be able to organize and to be able to keep a sense of humor in it because there's always 
personalities you're dealing with. A little old lady came in and she was 99 years old. I found that she wanted the glasses to sew. I went searching, came up with a decent frame. This is a French Valentino frame I'm gonna give her. And maybe 500, 600 dollars US in New York City. She had never had a pair of reading glasses in 99 years. And we put them on her and she was just overjoyed. And uh, it was a very touching moment to see her give hugs to everybody who was in the room. I'm happy that I was able to help her. <laughs> well, you can go chase the men down the street. Si no leo todavía. Si no este sí. Este me di mano venía de aquí así. Two years ago, when the wind was very strong on my eyes. Desde ahí. The, the skin is tight and it's pulling its eyelids down. The tridiums that you have are getting quite close to the pupil. Maybe we, we should do this one this day. You know? See. As a part of the surface of his cornea is now a raw surface and then there's an area on the, the white of the eye as well that's bare and the surface will heal in over that and over a few days. Especially in the case of the Down syndrome children, they've always been uh, very nearsighted. So we are delighted, and the children are also very excited that finally their eyes can be tested, measured, and they can get help. They can get glasses in order to see better. Little darling, it seems like years since it's been clear. Once you put the glasses on her, you can tell she's kind of looking through them. Once you fought having the glasses put on her face, and as soon as they're on, look at her looking yeah, around now. That young child, his whole family was wiped out by the shining pack and he was found in a pile of dead people. I suppose the mother had him. He was a year old. Kids in the orphanage, they need a lot of love because usually they don't have parents, they don't have relatives. Yeah, so they're really thankful for all what they can get out of you. You can just play with them or talk to them and they will be fine with it. It's not a perfect fit, but we can't get her to keep him on. Work gets quite routine at home, and um, I think if you give something to people, you always get a lot more back. And we really do get a lot back when we go on these trips. Well, the first day is always the worst day. We don't do that many cases. We start late, but I think things are going to go well. This machine only stays on for about five minutes. Nothing seems to be going our way on the first day. I think in the more remote areas where people don't have the money, a lot of times if the grandparents have gotten to the stage that they, they can't work in the fields or separate the grains and things like that, um, the parents and kids don't have the time to spend with them because they're out working themselves and uh, so they become shut-ins. If they can get you know, one eye to see better again, it, it can make a whole world of difference to not only to them but their families because suddenly they can be helping out and the families looking after the children so the parents can work. This patient doesn't see and can't hear anything, so we're not able to say much to him. Cataracts are kind of a universal problem. They're particularly common in the sun belt and in the altitude. People are just more exposed to the ultraviolet as well, so that you're, you're going to see fairly advanced cataracts here. Well, the cataract is inside the lens. It's basically the lens becoming opaque as one gets older, so that like a 
you know, a clear glass window getting cloudy. So we have our lens that we put inside the eye. It's a uh, kind of a, a circle with uh, two little legs, springy legs that hold it in place. And what happens is we push that into the space inside the eye to replace the cataract, the cloudy lens. She had a cataract operation last week in Cajamarca. It's quite exciting when you take the covers off and someone that had only light perception vision and hadn't seen their kids for a while. Just the joy in the face is amazing to see. I don't want to talk about diarrhea and vomiting because that's pretty gross. So I'm not going to talk about that. Oh, <laughs> well, there last week, I think it was Wednesday, we all had a bout of illness. The dreaded Montezuma's revenge. I feel feverish and a little hot and a little weakened. Not sure. I think it might be the one. No, they're really sick. Are they? Joan is sick. And so is Lisa. And so is Robert. And so is Trevor. And so is Caleb. They're getting wiped out one by one. I tell you, it's coming. I don't know if it's happening. epidemic. <laughs> What's happening? This is the survivor table. <laughs> We're trying to figure out who is the final survivor. <laughs> three people left. <laughs> there are three people and the cameraman and one half dead person here who decided to come for supper. I'm with you guys. <laughs> who went down first? Oh, okay. Who did the Trevor. 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 I woke up this morning. It's all went all. It's hard to even talk about it actually still. I actually ran to the washroom and I, I Threw up my breakfast. It wasn't a pretty picture. We, everyone heard across the whole clinic, and that was pretty embarrassing, actually. Like this morning, I I looked uh, I looked white, and that's saying something. <laughs> and then Joan, Joan was feeling the effect, but she was a trooper. She kept working right up to the very end. And she's how are you feeling today? Better, better than yesterday. Not so uh, pretty yesterday. Yeah. And Robert, Robert made it to the end, but he didn't make it to the hostel before he. Yeah. I said, if none of us survive, that may be the only record of our existence here in Peru. I want to know that we've been poisoned. I love you, my family, but uh, I died here in Peru. <laughs> well, it'll be a very interesting day tomorrow. <laughs> we, got, we got 400 patients tomorrow, and between four of us. <laughs>
I think I like them better when they are already cooked. For macho. For macho commission. The government primero. They yeah. eat the male first. Yeah. The male are eating first, guys. Watch yeah. out. Canada. Those are those are pets. Uh, my most memorable case so far would, would have to be Nielsen, the little 12-year-old uh, boy. He came in and immediately you knew that something wasn't right. His shoulders were all hunched over. When he sat down, he, he just sort of curled into himself and you could tell his, his self-esteem was terrible. Uh, it turns out that he was very myopic. He was minus 17 in, in each eye, which is very, very high, meaning that anything beyond pretty much the end of his nose was really, really blurry for him. Whether we have anything for Nielsen is the next question. I put some glasses on him. He kind of raised his head a little bit and had a look around and uh, he started to cry. Like, he just started to tear up a little bit. You could just see him opening up. I mean, he is from Ichokan. He's not one from one of the surrounding villages. And yet the sisters had never seen him before. They didn't know who he was. So it gives you an idea of how how insular his, his life has been uh, because of his vision. He's 12 years old, but he hasn't gone to school yet. He didn't go to school before because he couldn't see. Give us a zero or a zero to call you this place. He wants to go to school now. Yeah. It's so itchy. Oh, I'm so itchy. The people I come into contact with every day, um, they're not the cleanest. And these beautiful fleas have, have jumped off from one of their, their, their outfits or their hair, I don't know, but uh, really, 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 really itchy. What the heck just happened here? Don't you have something better to do? Oh, and it won't work for the chargers either. Like, that controls everything? It's more than a fuse. Muy problema. The devil messages. There's a conflict because we're in sort of in a palace of God here. Palace of God plus music of the devil equals heat, fire. Inevitable conflicts arising, and, and I think that's the problem that we've had. Uh, we're going to see the man the carpenter who's also an electrician, he'll come and check in and if not, we'll see if we can get a, a transform in San Marcos. When I was a little girl, my parents always had friends that worked in development countries. They always told me how is their work, what they are doing. I like the stories of the friends of my father's parents. So. I did it. I'm doing it. Gracias. <laughs> He's putting the seed in the ground. That was he doing today. He was saying that the harvest was very well. Sí, yo salgo en Radio San Marcos. Radio San Marcos. He works in the radio station in San Marcos. Yeah. His radio program is folklore. Es buena. <laughs> claro, claro. He's saying that. Um, in this part of uh, Peru, they believe in uh, what's called in Spanish duende. It's a little boy, it's like a devil. He loves the little children. This devil sometimes captures these children. Sometimes they die and uh, takes the soul with them. 
there's a saint called San Isidro and he has the gift to, to cause miracles, to stimulate more miracles. Uh, they dance uh, at his side. Yeah, so the devils are the fans of this saint. That's why they are dancing. <laughs> so when you dance, this dance of the devils, you have to do it 10 years in a row. What am I doing? Crack the whip. Okay. Do a whip. <laughs> we tried the whip earlier and uh, I'm, not, I'm not whip friendly. Because when you don't dance this 10 years in a row, and when you die, the devils will take them with you to the, to the hell. <laughs> Yes. I have to dance or I die? Ah, yeah, yeah. Muchas gracias, ya. Yeah. Acá estamos con el paquetito. Gracias. Oh. Yeah, gracias. Yeah, gracias. Monsanto banana. Two, two, two bananas in one. Half the peeling time, all the pleasure. Two complete bananas. Oh, what a revelation, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the Monsanto banana. Would you like skinny twin or fat twin? That one. Oh, you, you gave him the whistle. No, I gave him the ball and ah. the candy and <laughs> anything else. To prevent him from what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Screaming, crying, hating me forever, being traumatized for life. The last one. You should feel special. Let's ask him, are you excited? Because I have my phrase book here, okay? So, it's gonna be under making friends. Look at this! We got it from Arturo. Thank you for me, amigo Trevor. Mission accomplished. We talked 3,700 people or more probably over the last two weeks. It's been a humbling and uplifting experience. Our uh, new slogan became Mas Grande es Mas Bonito. <laughs> Just trying to make them think that, well, if the gringo wears them, it must be okay. It was very successful and uh, hopefully we did some good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are actually opening the Kuye. Fried rice, salad, and chicken for those who don't care for cooking. <laughs> That's our farewell. Let's be there. Here we go. No. We're shaking. Better pronounce it. Yes, yes. Next. Are you scared? No. Yeah, pretty much. Just eat the bones. They're just so small, you can just eat. It's crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> I've never eaten pet. I'm very anxious to go through the pet stores at home now and say, I've eaten you, I've eaten you, I've eaten you. Yeah, it's interesting. Crackle. It's good. It's tasty. It's a little fat. Mmm. Yummy. It's like chicken. A huge. Huge thanks has to go to the sisters. This is the smoothest project I've ever been on, and it is because of the work that they've done. Thank you for making our stay um, very enjoyable. And who didn't feel loved when they were getting sick and they were bringing you hot lemon tea? Yeah. your hair back. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Salud. You have uh, met some of the simplest people in our area. Never seen a doctor and never would have had an opportunity to get their eyes tested. To have glasses here is a luxury. So we really, really thank you. The comments of the people more than anything is how kind you have been with them. We bless you.
we grow together as not just a team but a family. In some way it is a family, it's a very strong bonded family. And by the time you end, there has been an experience that you've shared with these other people that no one else has. Finding out about TWEX, how just a bunch of autometrists give their time to help with their world country. Something that's very global and also something very local. It's kind of a way of giving back for me. The world that we live in back home is vastly different than the developing country, so it, it, just, it just humbles me. Just because they gain something from it doesn't mean necessarily that we don't gain something from it as well. And at times I think we gain more from it than they do. The highlight is catching the kids that wouldn't get checked if they hadn't come through and finding some that we could help. It's good value for the time that we spend here. 